Hey everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, as I said, my name is Bradford. I'm the team lead on the UI team here at Point Circle. I'm not the only UI team, but for a particular application, we call Pinon to Admin. Uh, this is our one of our company intranets. Uh, it's built in Reframe, and all the stuff you see here on the page is done in Closure. So we've been building out this application for a little, a little over a year now since I joined the team. And uh, we started off with not too much reframe knowledge, and we learned some things along the way. And in particular, um, some of the constraints that we're dealing with is we have one team, uh, the team that I work on as the lead, and then we have other teams that want to work with us on our application. Um, and that's because we don't want to have a separate deployment for each internet. So we say, OK, you can come in and build your code on top of our app. Um, the challenge there is, unlike when you do have separate applications, you don't have the same kind of isolation that you get um, from doing that. And that's why a lot of people also, they want to go towards microservices because they're like, oh, we get all this encapsulation for free. <laughs> um, that's the idea, at least. So the, on the other hand, there's the majestic monolith. And in order to make something like that work, you still have to have strong um, barriers between the components in your system. And I'm going to use this word uh, component a lot, which has kind of a, a big meaning in software development. But in this context, uh, it's probably the best word we have, where um, a component is uh, basically a rectangle on the screen. And so we're going to use that simple definition for the rest of the talk here. And we want to make these rectangles for one page, and then on another team, we want to be able to reuse it so we're not duplicating each other's work. And a lot of these engineers don't have front-end experience, so they want to come on and get started quickly just by a closure. And we're also working with people in the United Kingdom and um, Germany and different places across, across the globe. So I'm located in the United States, so I need to be able to let the other teams be productive even when I'm not in the office. Or in so how do we uh, go about doing this because if it was just as simple as making a reframe application, I wouldn't be here having to do this talk. Um, it, it really comes down to, like I said, isolation or modularity or whatever word you want to describe to say there might there's gotta be some kind of barrier or contract between these components. Because if we don't say how they're gonna talk to each other, there's no way we, they can really work together. So Modularity is a tough thing to nail down in a precise definition, so these are a few examples of what I mean when I say a component is modular. So if you give me a component and you say, hey, I have a new button for you to use, then I should be able to just add that to my component by adding a new line and not having to change my state management or anything that you brought with you that's going to affect me. And just the same, if, you're, if I'm already using your component, then there should be very limited ways in which your component is going to break my code. Um, and if it's not, your component is not modular. Um, the third thing is, once I write the component the first time, and I, I'm making another page later, I don't want to have to go back and rewrite the same component again. And this is something I have to look out for, even on my own stuff that I wrote, is somehow I write the stuff, and then I want to use it for something exactly the same thing later, and I still can't use it for some reason, so why does that happen? And if we can pull this off, we eventually get uh, what I think of as the Lego brick model, where this is the dream of a UI development team where you can have some kind of high-level description of what the components are and how they relate to each other, and based on that, we can do the harder work for you, which is the state management and um, linking these things up together. So how do we get to that Lego brick model with Reframe? Um, before we dive into the specifics, I wanted to give a brief overview of kind of the overall model and how components fit into the picture. So very quickly, a component is a rectangle on the screen, piece of your monitor, and a system is just a bunch of components together. So you could say a page is a system, or a, a 
this one component that's very complicated might be one team's responsibility, so that's their system. Don't overthink it. And then explicit state is a little bit of a wishy-washy definition, but in this case, it's how the components talk to each other. When I do something in this component, how does the other component receive that information and update based on that? An explicit state is really where we get stuck, uh, because if you just have sets of components, then that's pretty easy to understand, and they're just components living next to each other. It's only once you start having them talk to each other that you break modularity. So, um, how do we actually do this? I've tried to come up with the rules of thumb that I've learned and put them into specific patterns so that you can read these and understand what they're doing. It's not meant to be a design methodology or anything where it's like, okay, choose from these patterns and you're good to go. It's, the purpose here is when you're writing a component, um, what are the things that you're thinking of when you're making these decisions about what inputs I'm going to take or um, what kind of subscriptions am I going to use for reframe? And if you haven't used a reframe before, uh, I apologize, this talk might go a little bit over your head because it's very reframe um, focused, but the principles here should apply to any software project, not just UI development or reframe. So I'm going to go through each of these um, patterns and we'll show a code example of what that actually means in each case. So if we, we can go back to the first screen I showed, which is our real application. Um, I made, for this presentation, I made a really dumb sample application that just basically takes the essence of that and puts it in a very small app. So the, the fundamental thing about our app here is that you have filters on the left side and the results on the right side. And you're modifying these filters and you're getting the new results back. So I recreated this here where these filters are just arbitrary filters that you can add per page. Um, so you can see the state of the filters is it's toggled on and the search text is my search text. That's what I typed in the box. And the results are just um, whatever would be returned from that based on that filter from the server. So um, the first thing we're going to look at is the component definition patterns. And that's going to be each one of these um, pieces on the page, you can slice up into a rectangle. So what does that rectangle actually look like in the code? So there's a, a few different ways in reframe applications you can write components. Um, pure function is the one that everybody starts with. Everybody who knows closure is probably familiar with this, where in a reagent, a component is just a function that returns a vector. So to write UI code, you write functions that take data and return vectors. The only catch here is that we also have a procedure um, taken as input, which is the on toggle. So it's not just a plain data to plain data. You're putting in data and getting back a data structure with functions attached to it. And then that's how you know where everything can be clicked. So this is, uh, I've listed both the code and the interface. The interface is really trivial. It's just that toggle uh, on, on the left side. So you can see the label tag, the button tag, the text for it, and then the small amount of logic there to say, if it's on, the keyword on, then display the label on. So the, the, this is um, the simplest way to write a component. And if you can get away with it, often the best way to write a component because you don't have any dependencies in this besides what you give it right now. So if you're using toggle input in a parent component, you know that it's not going to conflict with any other call to toggle input unless you give it something in the on toggle uh, parameter that's, that's going to mess with that. But in general, if you stick with your functions, you're not going to run into modular, modularity problems. Um, but there's a downside is that on on one hand, the function itself is more modular, but on the other side, in order to use the function, you now have more requirements to put it into your app um, because now instead of just calling toggle input with no arguments, if it's a staple thing, you have to call it toggle input, and you somehow have to get current value from somewhere, 
and you have to describe what is going to happen when you do on toggle from somewhere. So by using a pure function, you're decoupling the component itself from the rest of the world, but it's a very high degree of decoupling. So your consumers might not think that's the most convenient way to use it if they have to go and basically re re rewrite all of your reframe subscriptions, for example. If they have to write the subscriptions and events, then you're not providing them much value by just giving them a function. So pure functions are good for things that don't require a lot of logic. Um, generally things that are meant to be structural, such as displaying a record on the page and it's just a static display of some data. The power in this um, comes from being able to mi mix the pure functions with other types of functions. And that's what we're going to dig into. So inline subscription and events is, this is kind of the default reframe way of adding state to a function. So you have two uh, reframe framework functions called subscribe and dispatch. And the reframe way is just use those right in your function. So if you need some data from the outside, you call subscribe and you get your filters. You don't know how the filters got there. You just know that they're available with the name filters. You also know that there's, um, there's going to be an event called set filter so that you can manipulate the return value when you actually get the subscription or the filters. So you have this little API now where you can get the filters and set the filters, but you don't necessarily know where those filters are being stored or where they came from. So this is a big, uh, this is a nice advantage because UIs are naturally hierarchical. So if you have lots of nested components and you have a button down here that Maybe it needs to know what the current filter is because this button's only active when that specific filter is selected. Then you're going to have to thread the state between 100 layers just to get to that button to tell it that it's disabled or whatever. So in this case, adding some um, adding some state that's not part of the arguments is actually making your life easier because you're hiding all of the different layers that you have to thread the state through. This is more of a problem with UIs because there's such, we build them as these nested structures. In a lot of functional programs, it's not so bad to nest stuff to thread things because you only have a few layers of function calls. Um, so a lot of, most people stop here at inline subscriptions and events and they're done. Um, and then they continue building reframe applications and that's it. But the, <laughs> the issue is that this kind of code is not very reusable because you're hard coding um, the subscriptions and the events directly inside the function, and this leads to, to issues later on. One of the issues is that since you're depending on reframe directly from the function, is that your tests are going to have to stub out reframe if you want to actually run your code. So you have to end up doing RF, reframe, reg subscription, reg event. You have to go to the implementation of your code, find all of the reframe stuff, stub it out, figure out what those values should be, and then you can write your tests. And in practice, this ends up making your tests a lot harder to read. So we've, on one hand, gained the benefit of not having to thread all this state through our components, um, through all these layers. But at the same time, we've kind of lost the benefit of um, being able to easily test these things and all the nice things about pure functions that we came to closure for. So this is actually a pattern that I learned before closure um, in JavaScript, where they call it the decorator pattern where you split your component into two parts, a stateless part and a stateful part. So the inner part, the core of the component, is the pure function. So in this case, what we've done is we have the first, I'm going back, we have the first toggle filter. This is a stateful function. If I go to the next screen, the new toggle filter is still a stateful function, but on the inside, we're calling toggle filter render, and that itself is a pure function. So what you can do is, this code on toggle filter is so trivial that you don't need to like test it that much. It's basically just calling the subscriptions and passing them in. So you can um, just ignore that testing that. You don't have to test it. Test the render function and make sure that all the elements are in the right place. And then test whatever subscriptions that you're also using separately in their own tests. And as long as you test both of those things, you're still getting the same amount of coverage, but you'll find that your tests themselves are a lot simpler to write because you're not testing stateful things at the same time as the structure of your markup. That's where it starts to get really hairy. So I would say, if you've never, um, 
if you've always been writing code like this and you've never seen this pattern before, um, I would start thinking about it because it's going to let your it's going to make your tests a lot easier to write. The next level of this is just an optimization where um, in, at Funny Circle we made a little library called Joyce, and basically it has one function in it called component right now, and the purpose of that function is to get rid of the boilerplate at the bottom here. So you can tell it uh, what are your subs what's your subscription for this component and what are some default parameters. In this case, we can pass uh, reframe events as default parameters. And it'll return a component just like any other component function. So the thing to keep in mind is this isn't meant to be a framework or anything. It's just a helper function that returns for each components. So this is a nice DSL that we use to simplify some of that. And uh, I think we'll end up open sourcing it pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Quite yet. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that covers that covers component definition. So those were patterns, basically four level, four degrees of completely decoupled pure functions going up to the stateful and then kind of splitting that up into two pieces. So you still keep the state, but you have the advantages of testing pure functions and stuff. And I personally tend to go with this version or at least um, separate functions because I don't, I've seen what the test looked like, otherwise I don't like it. Okay, so the next section, uh, there's there's only two parts to this one, component state patterns. Um, this could be direct or indirect, but I like the word injected better because it, it kind of brings to mind the idea of dependency injection where you have these parts of your system and you have some other thing that's putting the, putting the state in there. So let me show you what, the, what that actually means. So this code here looks, this is, um, this would be a piece of code from the filters. So we have a toggle and a text search. So if you type in there, it's gonna limit the results you get. And you can see we have a toggle filter component, text search, um, and it's in this toggle filters. And then we have a simplified root component which has that sidebar in it. Now, this code looks really simple um, but the problem is, the reason it looks simple is because all of the dependencies in how the components interact with each other are completely hidden and invisible from you. So while you get this extra readability on the top level, um, you're basically saying, if I give you a toggle filter, I have no idea what you need from, or if, if you give me a toggle filter, I have no idea what you need from me in order to make that work. So I probably have to go read through your code and look at the subscriptions and potentially refactor that code so I can put in my own subscriptions or rewrite my subscriptions. Um, it, it ends up with code that is very readable but uh, rigid. So and th this is really not so much from the top level, but from the inside of the component is how does it talk to other components? How does it um, communicate what is happening to those components? So if it's directly, that means if I go to the, we're using the same um, toggle filter component here. So if I go back to the definition of that toggle filter for this one, um, this is what I'm talking, this is uh, another aspect of what I'm talking about is that the subscriptions and, and the dispatch calls are part coded here. So you're basically saying toggle filter only works for one application and not the spot ever. If we wanted to solve that problem, we can parameterize the subscriptions and the dispatch. So you're basic, we're basically taking those calls and we're pushing up the responsibility up to the filters component. So now to filters, instead of just this no argument thing, we have to pass it the current state of the filters and the on change event. And this means that the filters component at the bottom is effectively a, a pure component so just by kind of moving the dependencies of the, the subscriptions and the events up the stack, you're putting all the components below it more pure. And that's generally what you want to do in an application is have a, a, the bigger core of pure functions and the, at the top you have all the state management in one place. 
So in this case, we've we've actually made toggle filter and text search filter modular because you know that for a fact, unless you actually tell how toggle filter is going to communicate with the other ones, there's no way for it to break that barrier because it doesn't have any other state to, to do with. It only knows how to call on toggle. So you can just read the code here and it could be cleaned up a little bit. But the nice thing about this code is it's completely explicit. So if I wanted to use filters in a different application, I would just pass a different state and different on change and I could actually use that code. So that's something that I think people find that this style inline stuff is uh, easier, but in the end I, I feel like it's less maintainable because you're kind of painting yourself into a corner early on by saying we're just going to hard code our behavior to one specific part of the application. More, especially for something like a filter, you'd probably want to use that on at least maybe a different page with a different filter. Okay, so that covers the component state, which is all about how it talk. So to refresh, component state patterns are all about how do you talk to other components through the retrain database. Component linking is about how does my component know about other components in the system and pull them in as children. So this is going to, um, it's, a, it's a similar problem here where not only is the state and everything implicit in this code sample for the filters, um, but also the bars themselves are hard coded. So you're referring directly to the top level toggle filter bar here. You're not getting it from anywhere else. So it means that you can only use that on these two filters with it. Um, so the the solution is, let's um, we're going to look at the text search filter here. So we're going to show the solution by taking text search filter and making. Um, oh, wait, sorry, I got I got mixed up there. We're looking at the results. So the the issue with this is that. The results here, A, B, C, these are hard-coded to a specific component. Um, let's see that code. So we have a component for results, which is the list of all of that list on the page. So in this case, it's another inline component where we have the records directly from a subscription, and then we loop through those records and we render them. And then it calls out to a result component, which is just uh, this item. So if I wanted a different kind of thing inside the result, I have no way to do that unless I use like width regex or something. So to go from direct linking components to injecting the components in, it sounds fancier than it really is. It just means you pass in the component functions as arguments to your component. So essentially it's a higher order function then. So now our result is, not the, the result anymore, it's the default result. So we have an argument to results where we can pass in a result. So if I want to pass in a blue result or a special result or whatever, then I can just pass that through an option. The downside of this is that you have to explicitly make parameters for every subcomponent that you have. But I think this is just uh, worth doing in practice. Because otherwise you can't, you can't Basically, you're saying at the top level, your component is completely frozen unless you have a way to parameterize it and take these stuff and plug them in. Okay, one last set of patterns. Um, so, in terms of defining a whole system, is what usually happens is people kind of just nest components directly together. Um, and this is the direct linking I just talked about. It works fine. Um, but what we've been doing at um, Hunting Circle is we've been using an actual dependency injection framework to basically put all the components in a map. And then based on the structure of the map, it'll assemble the components together and fill in the arguments for each component. So here you have that, this is the high level skeleton of the page where we um, 
have the header, the sidebar, and the content back here. So the header is the company internet, the sidebar is the filters on the left, and the content is on the right. So once again, you can't do anything. If somebody gives you this root, then what can I do with it besides render it? I can't do anything because it's just, a, I can just call it. Once you switch over to, and the, the reason I call this implicit is because you're defining the, the structure of your system implicitly by just linking things together. An explicit definition is we've been using um, integrant where we have a configuration for the page and each key in here um, represents an individual component. So we have the root, the title, the filters, and the results, just like the previous slide. But now, um, if you just look at that first part of the config, it, it looks, the root part has a similar structure, but it's a map instead. And we also have some extra configuration options, like the text of the title, um, we're, I'm talking about the blue result that we did before, where I can plug in my own result component. And then we also have the filters from the earlier example where I was setting the subscription for the filters and the change events, the dispatch for the filters, um, through the parameters. So I've basically taken all these parameters that we've added and put them, put them into one config file or one config structure so that now we have a data structure which basically is the page because you can merge it, you can associate, you can do whatever you want and it's going to actually render all that stuff because that data structure represents the UI. So in this case, I just, this is something that came up recently is we wanted to provide, um, we have all of our pages defined at Phonics Realize these maps. So you have like a big long page config which has all the nested information, all that. Um, and each team has its own map and they basically just plug in their own config options. So one thing that came up recently is we don't usually have to modify our own configs so much because we're the ones writing them. But we wanted to release a new version of the same page that was slightly different. So we want to basically do a feature uh, flagged um, kind of dark release. So if we just had that root component, how, how would we do that? We'd have to go and modify the root component so that we could pass in a different title or pass in different filters or whatever we wanted to customize about it. Um, and then if filters was the same way, we'd have to keep going, going, going and add parameters or so if you follow all the other patterns I talked about, you're gonna have a lot more parameters in your, uh, in your components themselves. So your root component's gonna start turning into this big let binding because you have to have, you have to pass in all the components for the root and then all those components have subcomponents that they depend on and then they have their own subcomponents. So you basically have all these lets at the top because it keeps pushing up all of the dependencies. So once you get to that point, you might as well just put it in a data structure and what this allowed me to do is I was able to just, I made a v2 config, so I took the changes that I wanted to apply for the version two, and I just set those as new config properties. Um, so in this case, I wanted to change where the state is stored for the filters. I wanted it, instead of being stored internally in the reframe database, I wanted the filters to be stored in the URL of the query parameters. So it has nothing to do with re the reframe DE actually. But since all of this, state changes and behavior are encapsulated by the reframe subscriptions and events. If I just change those subscriptions and events, I can completely change how the backend of the components works. And that's something that you cannot do without making parameters for the subscriptions and events. So you can see the V2 changes, it's taking the filters component that we had um, over here, and now that it's we have a config for it, I can pass in um, whatever I want for that. So that one was taking an on change, I can just pass in a different on change for a different subscription. And then in order to do that, since my config is already a data structure, I can just literally merge it together like a normal closure structure, and I have a new page. And then a lot of times we would just like copy and paste the code for um, feature flagging and stuff, because it's like, okay, you're not gonna change the old version anyways. But then if a bug comes up, you have to edit both versions and fix that. With this solution, you only have to edit one place because you're actually using the original version as the starting point. So I think that is kind of what brought it all together for me and it's 
I think it's really powerful to have a UI described as a data structure and being able to render that completely without any kind of extra side stuff just from this config. And you can see this is what the actual code looks like in our application is we use this library called Integrant. So we pass in the config to Integrant and init, and then it does all the hooking up stuff for us through the refs that you see at the top. And then at the end, it just gives us back our, all the components to map. So we take the root component out and we render it, and it has all the other components linked up already. The only thing I left out of this slide were the multi-methods to implement the hooks for all these keywords. So there's a little bit of glue code to go with internet, but it's uh, basically repeated every time, so you could factor that out if you wanted to. Okay, so that's those are the patterns that I've learned doing reframe. Um, I know there's a lot of information, so I think the slide, the slides and stuff will be online if you want to go back and reference them. Um, so the, the next things that I'm looking forward to is the Joyce um, library. We want to open source that function because I think even though it is a small amount of code, being able to spread your components as maps and kind of extend them that way um, is is really nice. And you know, I'd like to see more components like that. And one of the issues we had with the brief, like UI in general is everybody wants to have their own framework. So we just want to have a helper function and maybe some documentation. Because ultimately, all the stuff I showed you has nothing to do with any kind of framework. It's really just kind of software engineering one on one. So I think we, if we can focus on learning those principles instead of learning the frameworks, then we we're not going to get sucked into all this complexity that's traditionally associated with UI. So I want more documentation for the patterns that I showed, um, and more examples of configs, and potentially I could see like a library of just config structures, and you know, we have namespace keywords, so you can even put these online somewhere and just like pull them in and you can render a whole UI based on that, send it over the wire, it doesn't matter, it's a data structure. So I think that is kind of uncharted territory, um, in terms of like providing declarative UIs just out of the box. And that's where we're looking to go with Flying Circle is I want people to be able to just, um, if, even if you've never done Clojure before, you can probably handle this config file and understand it. So things that might be fun to do later on would be a directory of components. Now that we can read all the components as data, we can actually analyze which components each page is using and then have like an structure of the page to go and browse through for developers, like what components are being shared across all these pages. So that would be a cool developer tool that we could build um, having a data structure of our components. And then another thing I thought would be interesting would be since this is a data structure, in order to build a UI, you just change the data structure. So it would be very easy to build a, a WYSIWYG editor where you could just add components where you click something and it'll actually render that immediately because as long as you have a way to say this component goes here, you're basically just associating the component onto the, to the system, to the map, to the page. And I think that that's it for my presentation. Does anyone have